إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صلي وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا, رجالا ونساء فاتقوا واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد سأشار الماء خطبة ويت what is known as Khutbat al haja This is the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would start the khutbah with it. And interestingly, one of the new Muslims asked me that how come the imam is always talking about the same topic? He was referring to Khutbat al haja So he was looking at the starting of the khutbah and thinking of it as the main topic and then wondering why is it the same topic all the time. Interestingly enough, most of us do not pay attention to these beautiful words that we are reminded of in the start of the khutbah. But if we were to take that and reflect on our, on our past week as well as, as well as our future week, it will be very empowering for us. These are very powerful words and they're related to our main topic of today's khutbah. So I want to derive a few lessons from it. And, and highlight a few of the points that we can reflect on from these verses and this advice and then move on into the main topic of the khutbah, inshallah. So we start with, inna alhamdulillah. Verily, all praises, all perfect praises belong to Allah. And when we praise someone, in, in, an, in an essence, we praise someone for their own self. The praise of someone is not necessarily because of what they have done to us, what they have given us, but it is for who they are in and of themselves. And if you reflect on the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the wisdom and the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala runs this alam, this universe, you will definitely be impressed, reflect on how praiseworthy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And the more we do that, the more we reflect on us, the more benefits and blessings we get in our own life, realizing who our Rabb is, who is the one that chose to create us, that chose our existence, and so on and so forth. Then the next point was, Nahmadu, we praise Him. So that could be a reflection for us that how much do I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how much is my heart presence in the, when I'm praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next point about Nasta'inu, we seek His help. So that's a good reminder that if I'm stuck in something, if I'm concerned about something, if I'm worried about something, am I calling out to Allah? Am I seeking His assistance? Or am I only depending on my own strength and the strength of my allies, my friends, my network? And then the next point about nastaghfiru, which is a very important point for our dunya as well as our akhirah. Am I seeking sincere forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So when I do my adhkar and I seek forgiveness, is my heart present? Am I really sorry? Am I reflecting on the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the magnificence of the transgression that I commit against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then the next point about seeking refuge in Allah from the evil of our own self and the evil of our own deeds that make me realize that my negative actions, my sins, my disobediences to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an impact on my goals, on what I desire, on what I want to achieve in my life. 
So it gives me your two things. One is to refrain from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that quick gratification that I've tried to seek by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has severe long-term consequences. And if I fall into it, then I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prevent my own actions, my own sins in coming in between what I desire and what is good for me and my paradise and my dunya and my akhirah. Then the point about the notion that whoever Allah guides, no one can misguide. That is also very powerful when it comes to my own life in terms of knowledge and action, as well as the guidance of my family members and loved ones. Realizing my dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide me and guide my family and my loved ones. So once you realize that dependence, your obedience and your submission will increase. After that, the verses that I recited is a reminder to adopt the taqwa, the fear, the awareness, to take up protection between you and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the attribute, the name of Allah, which is the name of Rabb in those verses. And that is also a very powerful thing. If you reflect on Rabb, the meaning of Rabb, the implications of the word Rabb, it implies that Allah is the creator of everything, of every feeling, every thought, every action that I desire, that I want to have. Allah is the one who owns it. Allah is the one who can give it to me or take it away from me. Allah is the one who can increase it for me or decrease it for me. So my success lies in adopting the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the notion of do not die except that you're in the state of Islam, except that you are a Muslim. So what am I doing to protect my faith? What am I doing to protect my submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Continuing on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, orders us that to, to speak the truth. Being truthful is one of the greatest qualities. How truthful am I between me and my Rabb? How truthful am I between me and my family members? How truthful am I between me and the people around me? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that He will reform and make well my affairs, my actions, my goals, and He will forgive my sins. And finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares something which we are all after, and that is success. So we try to judge our success based on our uh, validation from our community, from our friends. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? That the one, that the one who obeys Allah and the Messenger of Allah has indeed achieved success, has indeed become successful. After that, that the best of the speech is a speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a good reflection would be that how much time do I spend reading or listening to that speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus everything else that I read, whether it be social media, all other forms of knowledge. How much time do I go back to the khayr al-kalam? And when it comes to the guidance, whose guidance, who is my success guru? Who do I seek guidance from? And who do I, whose guidance do I implement? Then moving on, sharr al-umur, the worst of the affairs are the innovations in the deen. Making new things in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how every innovation is a bidah and a bidah is a misguidance and gui misguidance leads to hellfire. This is also a very important thing. How many Muslim groups have come because of these innovations? The separations have come as a ma major reason of that being the innovations. It's something to very important to have our hearts together and to stick to the way of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After that, the main topic of our khutbah, one of the characteristics that are mentioned for success. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Asr that verily, by default, mankind is in the state of loss except those who have these four qualities, which are believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything that is coming out of that, such as the messengers, the books, the angels, the day of judgment, the qada and the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so forth. And then the righteous deeds, so actions that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Lastly, you can take of, t think of it as two or combine it into one. It's to advising, commanding each other upon patience and haq, the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawqidatil hasana. To call to the path of your Lord with wisdom and good admonition. So this is what we will be talking about, that how we can call different people to Allah in different roles that we play within the society and in different roles that they play within the society. So if I were to take a look at firstly, starting from our masajid and our center, and if we were to take a look at, a good thing to take a look at is the businesses around us, how do they call to their product? How, how much concerned they are to call people to their product and how much they understand their audience and how much they use the modern means of calling people to their product. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَرْجُونَ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَرْجُونَ And you expect from Allah, you hope from Allah for a reward that they do not hope for. So a thing to think about for the masajid and the centers and each one of us as well, how are we giving the beautiful knowledge about the purpose of this life, about who our creator is, about what success is. There are many, many, many people who are hungry and desiring to have this knowledge. Yes, there are a few who are opposing everything, who are going against the nature, but a vast majority of the people are open to learning and receiving. So what are we doing to, to spread that? Then the next level is, when someone becomes interested in Islam, when someone desires to practice, whether it be a young man or a young sister who has not been practicing but now realizes that success, tranquility, peace lies in submission to Allah, not the creation, how are we facilitating that for them? There are many people who come to the masajid seeking that peace from the people who are born Muslim and from the people who are raised up as non-Muslim and then they look up the masajid in the map and they come. So what can we do to make them successful? What are businesses doing? So if you think of any business that you have been exposed to, whether it be Uber, Lyft, a major product, whenever you try something, they reach out to you, they try to understand what's going on and how they can make you successful with that product by gradually implementing it removing the obstacles by giving you support so that you become a successful user, a successful implementer of that product. And then you become a voice for that product. Then you call other people to that product. So this is something to think about. Alhamdulillah, we have a program here, but for those of you who are listening or coming from other masajid and centers to think about what is my masjid doing to reach out and then to make people who are interested in Islam be successful. Moving on, what can we do as part of the congregation? As a general Muslim who comes and prays and leaves. And that is super important as well. So I'd like to narrate a verse from the Quran, the Kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَتَّخِذُوا أَيْمَانَكُمْ دَخَلًا بَيْنَكُمْ فَتَزِلَّ قَدَمٌ بَعْدَ ثُبُوتِهَا So, Part of that verse is also talking about how not to deter other people from Islam. So sometime when we come to the masajid, our action has consequences. The way that we look at new people, the way that we look at a new guy or a new sister coming in, the way that we welcome them has consequences. And there has been some ridiculous examples that happened even in today, which I was very surprised, 2018 people acting like that. So something to think about, am I welcoming? Or am I correcting? Because sometimes not correcting is the hikmah, as we'll see in a bit. Not correcting is part of the hikmah. To let the person connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to make sure that he's not feeling that when I walk in the masjid, every eye is on me. Everyone is seeing how I'm addressed wrong, how I'm praying wrong. So that's not part of welcoming because the person will be concerned that if I come in and I'm leaving with 10 advices and 10 things that I'm doing wrong and people are looking at me strangely, that is not welcoming. So you welcome them, you make sure that you welcome them, you're a new face, do you need anything? If you're sitting in a group or a clique, to make sure that they're also feeling welcome. 
And if they want space, you give them a space, and then you connect them to someone who can mentor or train them. But you just go ahead and keep correcting people can become a, a mess as well, especially for new people. So now, going forward, as parents and as teachers, what can we do to help people stick to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is very important because a lot of time we focus on the do's and the don'ts, the halal and the haram, while the child or the youth essentially does not know about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So you need to prioritize what needs to be focused on. Sometimes it is the halal and haram. But most of the time, if you see the person is not motivated to learn or not motivated to act, then what is lacking is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are a few ways we can do this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when describing about the hajj, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ فَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا Right? To mention and to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like you mentioned your forefathers. Now that may not be happening in our household, but a question could be who or what are we talking about most of the time in our household? How, many, how much do we talk about Allah? And I'm not saying to make it 100% about the Quran and what have you, but to think about what is my relative balance? How much is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His names and attributes are mentioned in my home? Or towards my students, right? Or, or towards my colleagues? Am I talking like Ibrahim alayhi salam would talk? That he's the one who created me and guided me. He's the one who feeds me. He's the one who cures me when I'm sick, right? Or how Musa alayhi salam talked when they were seen in front and Pharaoh at the back. And his calm, his nation was losing hope. And when our families lose hope, how, do we stand up as a leader, as a leader of the family, as elders of the family and tell them, no, there's a wisdom behind it. There's a choice, be, there's a wisdom behind every choice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how much are we helping them understand the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? which will then motivate them to love Allah and to love what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. So there could be many examples of that, such as the reading of Quran in the home, or even just reflecting on the afkar of what we say in the salah, just like how we did today about something that we are so accustomed to and how we saw that how powerful that is, which is the khutbah al haja are we reflecting on the afkar that we are supposed to be reading? When we start our food with Bismillah, or when we thank Allah, are we grateful? Are we, uh, are we transmitting that quality of gratefulness, the quality of gratitude? Right? When we walk out and we say Bismillah, tawakkaltu ala Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, are we conveying that, that we are putting our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and no success, no failure can come, except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on and so forth. So, are we conveying like Yaqub alayhi salam, when people, when his sons would lose hope, and, and he would show his confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah will bring back my family. So, are we being like those, or are we not talking and discussing who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, and what are his names and attributes? Looking at the seerah, the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he would correct and connect people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, telling them that Allah is the knower of the unseen. Allah is the one who does. I don't do. I can't guide. Allah is the one who guides. I cannot enter paradise except by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what level of confidence do we have to narrate and convey who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to our families? أقول قول هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. صلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم. It has been narrated from Abu Sa'id رضي الله عنه that he said سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول من رأى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيده 
فإن لم يستطع فبلسانه فإن لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك أضعف الإيمان. This beautiful hadith that tells us and instructs us to correct whenever we see something wrong by our hands if we are able to, if not, then by our tongue, and if not, then at least by our hearts, and that is the least level of iman. There are many benefits from this hadith, but for our point, we'll take a look at three. Number one is part of that is to understand the hadith and the Islam in totality. And that is to use your wisdom as well. So one of the principles is that if you are trying to correct something, you want to notice, will it cause a greater harm? Or will it lead to the going away of a greater good? This is very important. So if, you, if you're going to be talking to someone and the person stops coming to the masjid, or there's clear division in hearts, or the person will not accept it because he or she is not at that level, you have to use the greater wisdom and lead people step by step. So this is very important. Second thing is to realize that there are legitimate differences of opinions. So sometime you may be calling someone to, inviting someone to, because you studied that that's the right way. But when you studied that, that's the opinion, that's the right way of the teacher, and you should stick to it. But there may be someone who may have studied from someone else and may have a legitimate difference of opinion, so you do not want to be starting a fight or a quarrel over those points. Third thing is that we all claim, and even a lot of non-Muslims claim that they love God. But the implication of loving God, loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to love what Allah loves and is to hate what Allah hates. And to prioritize as well. So if something is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it should be more beloved to us as well compared to something that is of a lesser degree. So if we see a lot of things going wrong in the society, it is important to protect ourselves for being desensitized, to still consider that as wrong and as a transgression towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, now at a personal level, at a personal level, how can I call myself, how can I call my own nafs to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And again, there's a beautiful hadith that a Bajun man came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that the rules, the do's and the don'ts, the sharia of Islam has become a lot for him. So he was seeking for some advice that will make things easy for him, that will suffice him. And what did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised him with to not let your tongue be, un be unmoist from not remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to continuously remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be not negligent of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, alaykum bi dhikrillah, right? To, to, cons to be consistent about the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what we were talking about in the first part of the khutbah is to continuously invest in learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reminding ourselves and people around us regarding the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some of the lessons from this is that once I realize that my success is in the obedience of Allah and His Messenger, to take means to achieve that and to take means to make it easy for me. And part of that is to come to masajid, is to come to the houses of Allah is to engage in the da'wah, is to engage in the classes of knowledge, is to engage in the halaqah, and so on and so forth. So if I come as an individual, as a young man or a sister, or as an old man, old sister, regardless of my age, I have a right to come and be peaceful in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I, sometimes people don't come and they make an excuse, oh I come and this happened or that happened. But would you just let those minor things, which obviously we already mentioned people not to do that. But would you let those things prevent you from coming to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or would you be patient and slowly bring the change that you desire? Likewise, this does not mean that the, the prayer halls become a, a place of shouting and laughing and not giving people a chance to reflect and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point being that is to seek means to make it easy for you to practice the deen of 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, for the influencers in our community, for people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed with social status, power, influence, or wealth, for them to reflect and realize that this is by the mercy and favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are people with equal level of intellect, but they did not get the opportunities that I got. And to realize that if I do something thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will only increase me in my status and my wealth. And for them to be that role model that the young people can look up to. And for them not to hide their Islam. And be like Suleiman, the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How he would thank Allah, how he would take all the favors back to Allah. That this is from the father of my Lord to test me if I'm thankful or not. To use their influence, to use their achievements to inspire that Muslims are great contributors in the society. And when they make these contributions to the society, to the community, to consider doing that under the umbrella of Islam, under the umbrella or participation with an Islamic organization, this will also be a means of great influence and in calling people to the path of Allah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us from the good that we have heard and to make us from those who will remember and implement it. ربنا آتينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا اللهم آت نفوسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكها أنت وليها ومولها اللهم توفنا مسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين وانصرنا إبادك المسلمين وانصرنا المستضعفين المسلمين في كل مكان اللهم آتنا تقوى اللهم آتي تقوى اللهم آتنا حبك وحب من يحبك وعمل الذي يقربنا إلى حبك ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وأقيم الصلاة